the topic of legal frameworks as incubators for disaster management, Invest in Africa Kenya committed to hosting this session to allow one of the keynote speakers, Ms. Mutheo Kimilu, to navigate us through this very important topic of building cyber resilience. We are honored to have you here and please allow me to highlight our housekeeping rules. We kindly request that you mute your microphones to minimize the background noise and interruptions. We encourage you to utilize the chat function so that we can capture all your comments, views and questions. And we do recognize the immense resources that you bring to this session today. We encourage you to keep the conversation going through the hashtags and social media links on Facebook and LinkedIn. We will begin the remarks. We will begin the session with the open remarks from the country manager of Invest in Africa, Kenya, Ms. Terry Kinyoa. And thereafter, I will give the floor to our keynote speaker, Ms. Mutheo Kimilu. During today's session, we will run two polls. The objective of running these polls is for you, our distinguished participants and your organizations, to think about how you are prioritizing cyber resilience. We are running these polls in a safe space and feel free to give your candid feedback. The outcome of the poll will be shared later in the program. After Muthao's presentation, we will open the floor up for questions and answers using the chat function. We would like you, we would like to make this discussion as interactive as possible. So you're of course welcome to ask questions using the chat function as we go along. Due to the inter internet connectivity challenges, I might have to switch off my video on and off. Without further ado, I invite Ms. Terry Kinyua for the opening remarks. Over to you, Terry. Thank you very much, uh, Modoni, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to all of you from where you may be joining from. And um, I'm really delighted to welcome you to Invest in Africa's Ask the Experts webinar, uh, which is themed legal frameworks as incubators for disaster management, and we shall be focusing on building cyber resilience. We bring to you this um, webinar in partnership with Mastercard Foundation and Strathmore Business School. As uh, you've heard from our moderator of the day, my name is Terry Kinyua and I am the country manager for Invest in Africa, Kenya. And I'd like to begin uh, my remarks by highlighting very briefly about Invest in Africa. Very aware that many of you have interacted with Invest in Africa previously. We thank you for joining us again today. And I would also like to acknowledge there may be some of you that are interacting with us for the first time. Thank you too for joining us and we we anticipate that this is the beginning of a partnership journey together as we work towards creating prospering African economies. So Invest in Africa is a Pan-African partnership network committed to empowering small and medium enterprises in our various markets. We do this by convening um, key stakeholders who uh, together we improve access to skills, markets and finance for small and medium enterprises. We have presence in seven African countries, including Kenya and Ghana. And uh, today we are joined by SMEs from both Kenya and Ghana who are participating in this session. Um, we recognize the vital position that small and medium enterprises play in um, driving African economies. Therefore, we are dedicated to ensuring sustainability and survival of SMEs, even as we face very severe impacts from current ongoing global crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine war. It's in fact clear that disasters are growing <clears throat> both in frequency and magnitude and therefore it is imperative that as we seek to build resilient economies we must prioritize building the SME risk resilience. We also have to place a holistic view on disasters so that we can be able to effectively mitigate these, to prevent them, to manage risks on our road to resilience. And it is for this reason that Invest in Africa, along with various partners, launched a three-phased SME risk resilience initiative in 2020 in response to the onset of the pandemic. 
we focused the first phase on creating awareness of disasters and their impact where we had over 200 SMEs participating. And it was alarming to see that over 90% of SMEs do not have any resources dedicated to disasters as far as um, um, human resources, financial infrastructure and so on. And about 75% indicated that they need knowledge um, on protecting their businesses from the impacts of disasters. So in this second phase of the initiative, we have therefore been focused on building key collaborations with stakeholders so that we can drive an all of society approach towards implementing the recommendations of that first phase of the initiative. And it is in this spirit that we bring to you this Ask an Expert session today. This session is a follow-up of a webinar that we held a month ago about on uh, 27th of April uh, on legal frameworks as incubators for disaster management. We explored different legal frameworks during the webinar around disaster management and specifically in Kenya with the aim of strengthening these frameworks. Today, we'll be focusing on building cyber resilience of SMEs. As we are all aware, we are currently living in a digital world where every day we are faced with glaring risks of cyber threats. And um, especially for small and medium enterprises, this is a huge threat to our efficiency and our operations. This threat has been heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw the entire world enhance its digital presence. And um, like many other situations, SMEs remain particularly vulnerable, uh, but thankfully business owners have become increasingly aware of their exposure to these threats and the adverse effects that this can have on their businesses. So awareness of cyber security threats is a crucial starting point. We have begun the move towards building cyber resilience of SMEs by understanding what is at risk and what to protect. I believe we can all identify the right cybersecurity solutions to implement. Today, we have a great opportunity to engage our guest speaker with all our questions regarding cybersecurity and related risks. And therefore, I look forward to all your engagement, your participation. And at the end of the session, I also do look forward to your invaluable feedback. Thank you all and welcome once again to today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker, Ms. Mutheo Kimilu. Ms. Kimilu is an expert in cybersecurity, counterterrorism, crisis management, and data privacy. Uh, if you would like, of course, to have her detailed bio, please send a request directly to Invest in Africa, Kenya. Over to you, Mutheo. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we have run the poll. And as the poll is being done, um, the poll question to you was, how many of you have implemented any cybersecurity processes in your organization? And I want you to keep this in mind as we go through the presentation. So um, in Kenya, um, Sarianu uh, did uh, an analysis of how many people uh, major corporations, the, uh, the, the bigger uh, sized entities, actually had any cyber risk uh, preparation or training taken. And 74% of these organizations have not implemented any process to protect and secure um, the personal data they collect within their systems. 34% never trained staff on cybersecurity risks. 33% strain staff on cybersecurity risks annually only. A 24% train only when they experience a breach, which is kind of late. If you're already in problems, that's not the time to be training. But the golden standard that we all need to aim to are the 9% who train their staff on a monthly basis. And I'm sure right now many of you are thinking a monthly basis, that's too much. But hold that thought and we'll come back to it at the end of this presentation. Um, so. Essentially, you need to prioritize cybersecurity and your cyber resilience for your institution because all a cyber crim criminal needs is one small vulnerability. That's it. It's kind of like, let's use the house analogy. When you, when you leave your house, if you were to leave your door open even a little, 
a thief will come in and steal from you. So normally when you leave your house in the morning, you lock your door so that no thief comes in. That's a vulnerability in cyberspace you need to secure for your systems. So what is this cybersecurity? Cybersecurity refers to protecting the systems connected to the internet from threats in cyberspace. It involves protecting your software, your data, your hardware, and helps prevent cyber criminals from gaining access to devices or to your organization's networks. It's more than data protection. Data protection is a very, very important component of cybersecurity, but it's not cybersecurity. Um, and it's more than passwords. In Kenya, we had a mean going round about password, password, no. Cybersecurity is more than passwords. It's more than numbers you see on your screen when you watch movies. Um, in a nutshell, it's securing everything in the digital realm. That is your cyberspace. And so I can see um, we've so on the slide you have in front of you right now, this was just on a light note. We had password. This guy became a meme asking for password and cybersecurity. I assure you, cybersecurity is more than password. And then we also have cyber resilience. Cybersecurity, cyber resilience. Are they the same? Um, well, they are very interconnected, but they are not the same. Cyber resilience is the ability to prepare for respond to and recover from a cyber attack. So back in the day, we used to think that we could just rely on cybersecurity, but now we have realized that um, due to the number of attacks we are getting, we need to have the two. And cyber resilience helps your organization protect itself from its cyber risks, defend and limit the severity of the attacks and ensure that your organization is able to continue in existence, in operation after a cyber attack. Because unfortunately, a huge percentage of, of, of uh, companies and organizations go into liquidation after uh, a cyber attack. So we've moved the dial from cybersecurity alone. It's, you cannot just have cyber resilience alone. The two need to come together for us to have a secure, robust system in place to protect yourself and your organization. So what's the difference between cybersecurity and cyber resilience? Cybersecurity, like I said earlier, it, it, it um, relates to the procedures that you follow or the measures that you take to ensure the safety of a country or an organization because cybersecurity is not just about your systems and your financial systems. It goes into national security um, issues um, from cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, and also how it impacts the social economic welfare of our people. Then we have cyber resilience, um, and this is talking about, it basically relates with the capacity to recover. How resilient are you to recover from a cyber attack? So security secures you. Cyber resilient is a plan you need in place so that you're resilient enough to survive this attack. And you're going to see why you need to be resilient enough in a few moments. The technologies and the processes that you, you use for cyber security are focused on protecting your organizations, whereas the technologies and the processes for cyber resilience are meant to enable you to deliver your services even despite a cyber attack. Because if a cyber criminal shuts down your systems and you can't deliver your services, it's going to impact your business uh, adversely. You're going to lose all your customer base or a majority of the customer base. Um, cybersecurity works to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and to protect yourself from cyber theft or cyber espionage, you know, the stealing of your intellectual property. Um, cyber resilience works to ensure the continuity on a wider scope. And this is a combination of both your cybersecurity and your business requirements. Cybersecurity can work effectively without compromising the usability of other systems. However, cyber resilience requires an organization wide culture shift that normalizes and embeds security best practices. The same way when COVID came out, we all knew wear your mask, sanitize, wash your hands, or even as a child, you were told go to the bathroom before you eat, wash your hands. You need to normalize these cybersecurity policies and practices and resilience plans that they become second nature. If we were all in a room and a fire alarm went off, 
we would all know we leave and we leave by the stairs or the marked fire exits. We don't start entering lifts or sitting there sipping our tea as if there's nothing wrong. It's now second nature to us. It's the same way these cyber security strategies that you develop and cyber resilience plans and cyber hygiene awareness will have to become second nature. And finally, cybersecurity includes a business plan to resume operations in the event of a successful attack. Um, and cyber resilience requires the organization to become agile and adaptable in the face of cyber attacks and cyber incidents. The reason why you have to be agile and adaptable, you can't be static, is because cyberspace and technology evolves very fast. The threats we know today may be different from the ones that happen tomorrow. So if you experience an attack today, this is where your cyber resilience plan and your cyber security strategy come into play. You learn from the mistakes you made. Did you communicate effectively? If you didn't, how do you enhance that, that strategy so that you don't fall prey to the same mistakes again? You know, I have this saying, I say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So although they're different in nature, both cybersecurity and cyber resilience have each other's back. They both need to be there. Um, and since we know cybersecurity refers to methods and the processes of protecting your electronic data, it basically secures you in the digital realm. Cyber resilience, on the other hand, is how you can survive an attack and continue to operate. So to enable you to discern the difference between these two concepts, I'm going to use them. I'm going to explain them using um, two main types of cyber attacks that your organization may fall victim to. A data breach, which is when um, your sensitive information is either withdrawn from your systems or accessed by a cyber criminal or by a nation state. You know, if it's cyber warfare, they want to get your critical information. Or a malicious act that knocks your organization offline or disrupts your regular business operations, such as a ransomware or a denial of service attack. A ransomware is when they get into your system and it's almost like when you used to, used to hear someone is kidnapped and they ask for a ransom to release something. This is now the equivalent in cyberspace. They get into your systems, they deny access to those systems, and if you pay that ransom, you will not get access to your systems. So, um, in summary, a cybersecurity strategy can help prevent a data breach or reduce the risk of a malicious activity. A cyber resilience uh, strategy helps mitigate the impact of those um, attacks. And that's why your organization needs to have both of them um, together. So cybersecurity and cyber resilience are important because on the global average, a cyber attack occurs every 39 seconds. I think we've been in this meeting now for maybe about 10 or more minutes. Every 39 seconds, some system somewhere has been attacked. That's how frequent it is. And if you're thinking cybersecurity is a foreign thing, let I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, Kenya had the second highest cyber attacks on the African continent last year. South Africa had the most, but the difference between us was not by much. And just to give you a bit of perspective and a bit of historical um, notions for cybersecurity in Kenya. In Kenya, we developed our current cybersecurity strategy in 2014, um, which is uh, eight years ago to this year. And um, to be honest, that cybersecurity strategy, we need to urgently review it because it doesn't cover our current threat landscape. And before we do that, we would have to do what we call a national cybersecurity threat assessment, because you can only secure that which you know is a risk. But that aside, that's a conversation for another day. In 2014, we had 11.6 million internet users in Kenya. As of June last year, we had 46.74 million internet users. We're a population of 54 something or 50 something million Kenyans. So you can see almost 70% of our population is in the digital in the digital space, which gives which means that 70% of our population is vulnerable to a cyber attack. And in uh, between April to June last year, we um, the the KCERT, who are housed at the Communications Authority of Kenya, and they're our national cyber incident uh, response team, who monitor and secure our cyberspace 24-7, 365. They have sensors on some of our critical infrastructure, not all of our critical infrastructure, just some of it. 
And these uh, statistics are the statistics we're getting from those sensors, because if we're sitting right here and every 39 seconds a cyber attack has happened, if my phone has been attacked, chances are I'm not reporting it or I haven't even realized, as you soon realize you don't realize very easily. Or I'm scared if I talk about it, which many people and organizations don't want to reveal their vulnerabilities, I'm going to lose business. People will think they can't trust my systems anymore. So that's 38.78 million. Sounds colossal? It's not. You're going to see why. So the current number of recorded cyber attacks in Kenya, they don't capture our full threat landscape. In fact, um, the threats have more than doubled in the current financial year, which started in July last year. Um, and if you go on to the Communications Authority of Kenya case and page, you'll be able to get access to all these statistics and a lot of useful information for your organizations as well, even for your children on how to stay safe online. They even have a game called Cyber Soldiers, which you can see on their on their page. But coming back to what we're talking about, the authority reported an all time high last year in total we had 359.2 million recorded cyber threats this is a 133 percent increase from the 154.4 million recorded in the previous financial year and the 110 in 2019 and yet as i keep on repeating this is not our true threat landscape so if you don't have a cyber security strategy you don't have a cyber resilience plan please start paying attention and now see why you need to have it because you can see we are being attacked we are vulnerable the reason why we had um, these rise in cyber attacks um, was due to covid um, COVID was not just a, a global health pandemic, it wasn't just an economic pandemic or a social welfare pandemic, it's also been a cyber pandemic. On a positive note, it's enhanced the uh, adoption of digital transformation. For example, this webinar we're having right now, um, pre-COVID, this was not a norm, but now we're all operating this way, remote working, and being able to connect around the world on platforms like this. But on a negative note, it increased the number of cyber attacks um, the, and Internet desperados are now preying on what people not being aware of what has happened because we embrace digital transformation so quickly. We didn't have time to train people on how to be safe in this um, new fifth domain, as we refer to it. And so for a criminal, you tend to go where it's easy to strike. So why would I go um, try and break into that house that has a uh, stone wall, electric fence, guards, you know, Rottweilers, everything around? I'll go to the one where they've left their door wide open. I mean, I want to make easy money. That's what criminals are all about. It's easy gain. So these, they turned their focus on Africa um, because um, our systems, our infrastructure and our cyber hygiene awareness here are very low. They're not as developed as many Western Western nations. And so we became easier targets for them. And remember, Kenya had the second highest level of cyber attacks in Kenya uh, on, uh, in Africa. And this is because um, we've embraced digital transformation. You've already seen that oh, more than 70 percent of our population is online. We use digital uh, payment systems as a norm. I mean, M-Pesa is uh, is a platform that all of us had. In fact, if somebody was to uh, bring M-Pesa down in Kenya, that's an act of war, you know, literally a cyber act of war against our nation. So um, we are all prey. We are all easy pickings for these cyber criminals. And that's why you need to secure yourself and your organization um, in cyberspace. So what if my systems get attacked? It's not a big deal, right? I mean, I'm a small SMSC. Nobody knows about me. They're going to go for the big corporation out there. By the time they get to me, ah, it will be end of days. No, that is a wrong attitude. Um, and I'll just give you an example. Uh, when we're talking about disaster management, and I'm sure at the at the previous uh, sessions you've had with IIA and other and SBS and other teams, you talk about disasters like floods, hur hurricanes, you know, mudslides. Those that, those are what you normally conceptualized as a as a disaster or fires. Um, you know, Australia had those fires that burnt forever. 
here in Africa, we have a lot of um, disasters with um, mudslides and uh, flooding, or even our workers going um, in mines and collapse on them. But just to give you a global perspective, I'll, um, because I'm going to quote it in dollars just for comparison purposes, um, in the US, they had a hurricane called Katrina, which um, is on record as their costliest, uh, their most expensive hurricane in, U in US history to date. And that cost them um, financially, and the number is still growing, $108 billion. And they lost, um, uh, about 1,200 lives were lost in Katrina. And you know, you can never fully quantify what a person's life is worth. You know, you just have to ask a loved one mourning their, their departed one. We lawyers and insurance people will try to say all sorts of income, life expenditure, but you can never, I mean, in my books at least, life is priceless. So as much as you're putting 108 billion, we've also got to recognize there was a loss of life. And millions of others lost their homes and their livelihoods. And this happened several years ago, and they're still trying to recover from that to date. And this is America. Now, that 108 billion being the most expensive hurricane damage they've had, the average cost of a cyber breach in 2022 is estimated to stand at, on the global average, $4.24 million. And remember, we have an attack uh, please go back to the other slide. We have an attack happening every 39 seconds, and the results depict the colossal magnitude of the financial impact of cyber attacks. Additionally, and more importantly, cyber attacks also result in a loss of lives. In fact, the first one of the first known cases of a cyber attack that led to uh, had a life or death consequence was actually a baby in a hospital in Alabama who the hospital had was experiencing a ransomware attack. This baby was born, um, had breathing complications because the cord had the umbilical cord had been around his neck. Um, they couldn't get the respiratory systems online because their systems had been brought down, and so the baby died. So you see, cyber attacks don't just impact you financially, business business wise. They can also impact loss of life. So IBM and the Ponemon Institute um, do an annual report, which they normally release every, I think it's every July or August, um, where they, they, they go on the global stage and they analyze um, what's been happening around the world. And um, in the chart ahead of you, it may be too small to be seen, I don't know, but the first dot you'll see where we had the first dot, that was actually in 2015. And the reason why we started marking um, cyber breaches and how much they cost people from 2015, that's because that's when cryptocurrencies enter the market in a big way. You see, before if I came and I shut down your system, I would tell you, uh, pay me my ransom through a check, which the cops can trace. They can see where I'm going to cash it or through a bank transfer. That's traceable. In cyberspace, attribution is still a big, it's very problematic and more so in 2015. Now we have algorithms and systems in place where we can actually track crypto as much as those platforms try to market them as being fully anonymous. It's just that it's expensive and not easily attainable for all of us to do it. So in 2015 is when we had a high surge. And then in the middle of that chart, you'll see there's a place where it goes kind of straight and flat, it plateaued out. The reason why it plateaued out is because the EU um, enacted and uh, the GDPR, uh, which is the EU General Data Protection Regulation, which is the most stringent data protection law in the world. In fact, our Kenyan data protection law borrows heavily from it, came into place. So even if, even if people were, were, were taking a lax attitude towards securing data, because of the colossal penalties you can incur if you violate the GDPR, you find the breaches kind of flatlined because nobody, everybody's focusing on cyber security and cyber resilience to focus, to secure their systems because nobody wanted to pay those penalties. And then finally, you see this funny spike where it goes up. That's 2020. That's COVID. We all went online. We all were not prepared. We were remote working. So even in the office, you had systems, your staff are now remote working. It became a crisis. And um, the global average is now at 4.24 million for each breach, not one breach. 
And so what does this 4.24 million um, work out to be? Um, you'll see in front of you there's a circle with a dark blue uh, section. The, it, it costs you 29% of this $1.24 million uh, goes into detection and escalation because you're trying to detect who's in your system, how do you escalate it, what needs to be done. Then you have gray. Gray is notification. You know, that takes about 6% of that, of that breach cost. Because even under our local data protection law, if your system is compromised, you're legally obliged to inform me that my data contained in your system has been compromised. Then we have the light blue section, which is the post-breach response, you know. How are you handling um, securing your systems, you know, paying any penalties you may have incurred as a result of that. And that takes 27% 20, of that 4.24 million. And the biggest lump of this, and this is why as organizations, you need to ensure your cyber security strategies and cyber resilience plans are update and um, keeping on being reviewed that results in loss of business and most businesses especially many of us smes and smaller entities do not survive this so um, it's important that we now start paying um, attention to cybersecurity, and it takes a central place in all your disaster management preparedness so we now know we now know cyber attacks happen frequently we know they're expensive but see if you're attacked you'll be able to figure it out and then quickly stop it not so. On average, it takes you 212 days. On average, it takes you 212 days to identify and contain a breach. So just for perspective, if I as a cyber criminal, and I'm not, have entered your system on the 1st of January 2021, by the time you figure I am in your system, and you've contained me, it will be 287 days later. That's December. In that time, I have been in your system wrecking havoc, stealing your information, stealing your finances. I mean, can you imagine all of that happening? And even if you catch me, maybe I've put another back door where I can come back. So even if you pay your ransom, ah, now I know you pay ransom, I'll come back again because I already have a back door. I have been in your system for over 200 days before you even know I am there. And if I've been in your system for more than 200 days, then that cost of a breach goes even higher. It goes to 4.87 million. And if you want more information on this, if you go on Google, IBM has this report accessible to the public. So cyberspace has now been deemed a new hazard category in emergency management. And governments and organizations around the world are realizing that cyberspace is actually a major hazard category. So when we're talking about strengthening our legal frameworks, we need to factor in the dangers of cyberspace in any disaster management emergency preparedness uh, legal frameworks we, we develop. And so the governments are now realizing that enhanced cybersecurity capabilities um, within the emergency management uh, sector needs to prior needs to be prioritized as well. And they need to coordinate with the different agencies because cybersecurity, you know, in Africa, we have this thing where as soon as you say the word security, you think, ah, it's defense, it's intelligence, it's uh, police, you know? No, it has the name cybersecurity in it, but we need to shift from that mindset of thinking it's our security, our intelligence um, agencies, that need to work on it. In cybersecurity, it needs a multi-stakeholder approach. Everybody from the president to the person selling the vegetables in the market, from the CEO to the janitor, from the private sector to the public sector, because a lot of our critical infrastructure is actually in the, in the, in the private sector. And so we now need to prioritize it because a lot of these breaches happen twofold. It could be accidental, me just not being aware, which many people are not aware. So if you're not aware, don't feel bad. There are very, very many people who are not aware how serious this is. And this is why platforms like this help us make you aware. And then there are those who are malicious, who are waiting to try and steal from you. So um, it has now become a major hazard category. And I hope you'll also make it a major hazard category um, in your business continuity plans. 
And so um, when we talk cybersecurity, everybody tends to think cybersecurity is financial impact, business. We now know you can also lose life. Do you know we can use technology to trigger uh, natural, natural things? For example, my alma mater, the University of Reading in the UK, they developed rainfall technology that may one day resolve water scarcity in many areas, uh, many arid areas in the future. This is the beauty of technology. It has a lot of positive benefits, but with everything good, there's always a bad side to it. Um, and this technology, which was created University of Reading was actually used in Dubai last year, which is where this image in front of you comes from, where they created uh, rain using um, this technology, it basically uses electric charges from drones to manipulate the weather and force rainfall across their desert nation. And while this is a good development, you know, there are always malicious people who are looking to weaponize um, a lot of this technology. So what if this rain technology was manipulated by a malicious actor to flood an area, you know, uh, disrupting that nation's economy by doing so, you know, there'll be damage to human livelihoods and more importantly, loss of life. So technology, just for your information, can now be used to trigger most what we deem traditional natural disasters. That is rain, fire, volcanic activity. And so it's important that even if you're having any disaster management emergency preparation conversations, that um, you factor in this technological aspect. But this is a little bit going off topic. Let's just get back to where we were our businesses. So um, there's what we call cybersecurity. Um, DMEP, Disaster Management Emergency Preparedness. It follows a similar cycle to regular disaster management, emergency preparedness, you know, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, you know, response, recovery. Um, and like I mentioned before, it needs a multi-stakeholder approach. All of us have a role to play in securing cyberspace. Um, it needs a public and the private sector. A lot of our critical infrastructure is in the private sector. Like I said earlier, if M-Pesa was brought down, that's an act of war. And that's something that's in the private sector. Um, and so when you're trying to secure your critical infrastructure, what we do in cyber cybersecurity, we prioritize. And if it's in your organization, you prioritize what's the most important thing because cybersecurity is expensive. The technology is expensive. So as in an ideal world, you'd want to secure everything, but you need to start by prioritizing. So when it comes to cybersecurity um, DMVP, you need the three main things you need to remember in summary, plan, prevent, and ensure. And we're going to see how these work now. So what is a cybersecurity strategy? You know, I've, I've mentioned plan, prevent, ensure. Um, this is a strategy. The first thing in this strategy that you, ne you need to do, you need to plan. You know, whether you're doing your security strategy or your cyber resilience uh, plan. And the step one, you need step one, I'll give you 10 steps you need to take. It's not an exhausted list, but it's just a summary in the short time that I have. You need to you need to educate the board of directors and the senior management because these are the people who approve budgets. So if you're in IT or something and they'll be like, that's that's a problem for IT. No, they stops with them and they need to know when you're asking for this expensive thing, why do they need to approve it? Then step two, you need to identify your critical infrastructure. Like I said, Ideal, you'd want to secure everything, but you can't do that. You know, it's really expensive. I wish we could. Step three, develop an actionable cyber incident plan. You know, this is where your cyber resilience comes in. Do you have a plan where once that uh, cyber breach has been detected, which has been in your systems for maybe over 200 days, and you finally flagged it, who do you call? What do you do? Who does what? What system do you shut down? Is your main system connected to your backup system? Because if they're connected, that thing could jump on that virus or whatever is there. Malware can jump to the other system. The people you're calling are the right numbers on the uh, uh, the telephone numbers. Are they the current numbers they have? So you need to have this plan for that kind of detail. And then you need to carry out regular cyber incidents and cyber training, which is why that gold standard of 9% who train every month, so that people become aware. They know what to do so that when a cyber attack happens, you're not like, ah, what do we do? Where do we go? What do we do? Oh my God, our business, our business. No, you're ready. 
you, you're, you've planned for it, you're ready for it, and you can prevent it from messing your systems further. Step four, you need and uh, develop in-house mandatory daily cybersecurity practices. For example, if you deal with sensitive information, when you walk away from your screen, shut it down so that whoever's passing by afterwards maybe doesn't have authorized access, doesn't access that information. Step five, establish basic cybersecurity procedures. How do your staff, if they're working remotely, access their um, office systems? Do they have endpoint security? Do they know that they should not go and use free Wi-Fi to transmit sensitive data? If it's a sensitive file, are you using encryption encryption methods to ensure that that information is not being accessed by a malicious party from one end to the other? These are the kind of things you need to start looking and putting into your plans. Step six, acquire appropriate cybersecurity technology and services. And like I said, this is expensive, so that's why you need to start with your critical infrastructure first. Step seven, ensure applicable authorization is in place to facilitate network monitoring. We now have Data Protection Act in place. We have our Computer Misuse and Cybercrimes uh, Act in place. Um, you need to have, from a legal perspective, consent from your staff to monitor them. Do they give you consent? Even if they are working for you, maybe it's in their contract. If it's not, give them a training and let them give you consent that you can monitor what they're doing in your systems for cybersecurity purposes. Step eight, ensure your legal counsel is conversant with technology and cyber incident management. I know on the legal stage, I am one of a very few formally trained uh, cybersecurity lawyers, maybe the only one on this part of the world. However, we have a lot of very competent data protection and technology lawyers, even here in Kenya, very, very many of them, you know, qualified, certified lawyers. Make sure the lawyer is one who knows what they're talking about so that they need to advise you. What, do you, what are your reporting requirements under the data protection law? What are your reporting requirements? or what do you need to do under the computer misuse? Make sure you have a lawyer who has that kind of a, a technological background. What about your PR team? Do you have a PR team? Do they know how to handle a crisis? Because God forbid, if you're a bank or something and people hear that your systems have been breached, there could be a run on deposits. Or if I'm in a business, uh, people will pay where I'm holding sensitive information. People will, will pull their business away from you. So you need to, to manage that. So you need to have the right people who are part of your team, who are trained with you, so that you all know what to do. And finally, you need to form relationships with legitimate private and public cyber information sharing and analysis organizations. You know, if you don't have the capability, you can outsource these services um, to, there are many, uh, there are companies out there like Serian or Dimension Data who have got the cybersecurity technical expertise to advise you. You also can turn to KSET, who I mentioned. They're our National Cyber Computer Incident Response Team, housed at the Communications Authority of Kenya. Our DCI has got a digital forensics laboratory. You and I may not know how to trace that stuff, but these guys are trained. And when you go to court, you need evidence that's admissible. So we still have a lot of capacity building to do as a nation, but these are things, these are resources that you need to know are there and make use of them. So we've learned, we've now learned that we need to plan. We know what we're going to put into our cybersecurity strategies and our cyber resilience plans. Now we need to talk about preventing the second step of cybersecurity, DMVP, plan, prevent, ensure, prevent. Preparation, capacity enhancement, and cyber hygiene awareness maximization are all pivotal to prevent cyber breaches. Um, when it comes to your cyber incident response plan, make sure you keep on doing this, train your staff. All of you keep on going for these trainings. Don't be that 74% who we've learned. And then your poll, I don't know how your answers were, who we learned, maybe you're part of that 74, who do nothing, have nothing in place. You want to be part of that golden standard, the 9% who are training on a monthly basis. Secondly, there are things which are important for you to know. If you uh, find your system has been hacked and you're able to tell, oh, it's Mozilla's system hacking me. 
don't hack me back. And this is why you need to have the right legal people in place. That's actually a crime. If you hack back, it's a crime because you're getting unauthorized access to my systems, which is a crime under our computer, Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act. Secondly, you don't have consent to get to my systems. And thirdly, and more importantly, Mudo could be an innocent bystander. These cyber criminals use things called botnets, where it can make it look like it's my system attacking you, yet I have no idea of what's going on. This is why you need to ensure that you work closely with people who are competent in this field to advise you so that you don't make a bad situation worse. So the final leg, the final arm of uh, cybersecurity DMEP, plan prevent, is ensure. If you have a car or you have a business, most of us take out uh, insurance so that if my car or my Buddha Buddha is hit by another person, my insurance, if I have comprehensive cover, will cover that because I may not be able to afford it when it happens to be able to replace or do the repairs required in these hard economic times. It's the same thing in in, in, when it comes to cybersecurity. You need to have a specific cyber insurance policy because most of your business general liability policies don't cover cyber insurance. However, um, cyber insurance is very expensive. And in Kenya, the reinsurance industry, the reinsurance are the ones who insure the insurance industry, are already saying it's unaffordable. And it's not just them, it's on the global stage. You can imagine in one breach on average is $4.24 million. It's becoming really, really untenable. So um, the government may have to go what the US did after 9-11 when they had a terrorist attack in 9-11. Uh, and suddenly the insurance and the reinsurance industry could not afford um, terrorism insurance. The government had to become a reinsurer for terrorism insurance so that people could get those policies. In Kenya and indeed on the global stage, we may have to go that way where governments become a reinsurer. But please look out there, get a cyber insurance policy because they are available in Kenya. So to sum it up, your cybersecurity strategy cycle is plan, prevent, ensure. You know you need to identify what what you what you want to what you want to protect. Then you need to protect it. Then you need to have people monitoring your systems to detect. And this is why if you have an organization, you need to set up what are referred to as cyber defense um, centers, CDCs within your organization. It could be part of your ICT team who focus on just monitoring your systems, especially if you're dealing with critical sensitive information to make sure there are no breaches. Then how do you respond? Do you have the right people? Have you people practiced your plan? Do you all know what to do, where to go? How do you recover? This is where your insurance comes in. And if you have your cybersecurity strategy and your cyber resilience plan, you will be able to recover, inshallah, because many people who don't have this plan are the ones who do not recover. And um, to some topic on cyber uh, security strategies and cyber resilience, there are seven main steps you need to do. You need to ensure that your systems are hygienic, you know, get your network guys, your IT guys um, to be proactive and to continuously monitor your systems. You need to develop a plan, which is what we've been talking about today. If you don't have a plan, start now. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. It's a plan. It's an idea. You start thinking about it. Having even two lines is better than no line, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You need to map out your risk profile, depending on what business you're doing. What are your most risky things that you want to secure? What's your critical infrastructure? You need to assess and measure what are you going to do? And don't overanalyze this, huh? because these things are evolving. Don't, don't get tied down on too much over analysis. Be agile, be adaptable, be flexible. Like we said, to be cyber resilient, you have to be flexible and agile. You need to take steps to mitigate that risk. You need to take uh, cyber insurance. And finally, get started. Get started today. Because if you don't, I don't want the next, when you have a cyber attack, be one of those uh, unfortunate people who uh, the cyber criminals get to every 39 seconds, you don't want to say our cyber incident plan is like, ah, I need help. No, it has to be, hey, it's happened. We found it. Let's do one, two, three, four. So um, cyber resilience is affected by having that plan in place. Don't be the 74 percent. Don't don't be the 34 percent who never trained their staff. Be that golden um, 
a number we're trying to get to in Kenya, that 9% who do this on a, on a regular basis. So um, we've talked about cybersecurity, we've talked about cyber resilience, you know what to do. Do you know that 95% of all cyber breaches are due to the human factor? It's never a system failure. That system fails because of us humans. And so cyber hygiene is very, very important, especially because a cyber breach happens, remember, every 39 seconds. So what is the cyber hygiene? Cyber hygiene, these are the steps um, that anybody who's using any digital device, a computer, your phone, your iPad, whatever it is, any device can take to improve your online security and maintain system health. Um, for example, when COVID came, we all learned sanitize, sanitize your hands, wear your mask. Now there's been um, pandemic fatigue. People are not sanitizing the way they used to. People are not wearing masks. The numbers are going up. So I hope when you're going out, you do remember to wear your mask. But cyber hygiene means adopting a security centric mindset. And these are the habits that if you adopt them will mitigate potential online breaches. Um, and so it has to become part of every day, your everyday routine. You can't get fatigued about cyber hygiene the way you got fatigued about wearing your mask. No, 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 no. Because if you don't, then your business is going to go down. The same way you need to wear that mask so that we have you ar around with us for a long, long time to come. Um, there are numerous steps you can take um, to, to ensure that your, your organization and even yourself in your day-to-day -day interactions with the digital realm do to secure yourself um, and practice what we call cyber hygiene best practices. Um, I'm going to give you about 10 points. This list is not exhaustive. It's just some of the main ones you can do. Ensure your endpoint security. If you're working remotely, that endpoint security where people are entering your organization service, how is this in place? You know, this includes things like antivirus, you know, um, malware detection systems. Ensure your sensitive files are encrypted. Most of us have WhatsApp. You'll normally see that message that says end-to-end -end encrypted. It basically means when I send you a message between my device and your device, it's gibberish until it lands on your device. That message, that audio, that photo. Most of us don't have the skill sets to get to get to it. So encryption secures your your data that some malicious person does not get to it. It's like having that lock, that wall, that gate, that Rottweiler in your compound to stop the criminal access in your compound. Use multi-factor authentications. Many of us will see many of our banks these days. Many of us will find that many of our banks these days, you don't just log on to your online banking platform. It will ask you for another step. Sometimes they'll even tell you, we'll send you a message to your recognized line. Those are multi-factor authentications that you do. It's more than one authentication. And the more you have in place, the more gates I have to pass before I get to your house. When you get to my house, maybe you pass one gate. When we're trying to get to State House, Shanga, I'm sure there's more than one gate to get to State House itself. That's the authentication. You, you need to be authentic. You, you, you need to be cleared before you can get to the next step. I say shut down and time out your work laptops when you're not in when they're not in use so that any sensitive information is not seen by somebody else. Don't access free Wi-Fi stop, uh, free Wi-Fi spots. Many of us these days, if you go to many of our coffee houses during the day, you find people working on their computers, the economy is hard, we want to get free Wi-Fi which is well and good. However, no, the cyber criminals know this. So where there's free Wi-Fi, whether it's in the coffee shop, in the mall, in the airport, anywhere, they are lurking there because those systems are more vulnerable. So if you must use free Wi-Fi, then use something called a VPN, which is a virtual private network, which secures your, your system. Or if you are having to transmit sensitive data, it's worth buying a, a bundle which is more secure and transmitting it using that as opposed to um, free Wi-Fi. The other thing is in this digital age, many of us have smart devices. Everybody, you hear Alexa, Siri, you've got your smart watches. There's a lot of smart things around us which really make our life convenient and easy. However, they are also vulnerable. Remember, if something is connected to the internet, 
it is connected to the digital realm. The cyber criminals are out there, and so they can hack anything. In fact, there's a funny story of a major uh, casino um, somewhere on the strip in, La in Las Vegas, and their system was hacked through a fish tank thermometer. So if you have a meeting and you've got a smart device around you, switch it off before you communicate any sensitive information. And be careful. You know, they say Big Brother is always listening. Big Brother is always watching. It's true. But now it's not Big Brother. It's Big Criminal. Um, don't mix your work and personal devices. Many of us will access our work emails from our mobile phones. We've downloaded games, or if you have kids, they've downloaded games. We're watching YouTube and TikTok. Unbeknownst to us, when we download those apps, there could be malware in it. And this is malware that we, we don't know. Remember, it can take you over 200 days to detect it's there. So try and distinguish the two devices as much as possible. And this ties into the next one. Don't download apps and games. And albeit not a technical thing, if you're remote working, shred your papers. Don't just throw them in your bin because if I know you're a CEO of a company or an entity, I just need to come and collect your garbage and I'll get access to your um, company's sensitive information. And finally, we need to remember that cybersecurity is in all our hands. Security and cyber resilience come together. They become the padlock that secures your systems, your organization, your business continuity. You, it, it, it works hand in hand with cyber hygiene, and we all, all of us, have a role to play um, in cybersecurity, not just um, for ourselves, for our businesses, but to secure our nation. And um, that's all I have. I have for you. Mudani, I hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Mutheu. A lot, a lot of information there that is definitely geared towards meeting our objective of formulating cybersecurity strategies, policies, and best practices for our organization. Fine. So um, we talk about cybersecurity and cyber resilience. One is basically planning and preventing cybersecurity. Remember, cybersecurity is protecting your digital realm, hence the term cyber security. Cyber resilience is how resilient will you be after a cyber attack? Um, will you be able to survive? Will your business be able to continue? Because 38% of businesses, or even more, um, when it comes to the cost of a breach, 38% of the cost of a breach goes is because businesses go down. On the global average, unfortunately, very many MSMEs, uh, basically the small businesses, the moms and pop stores, are shutting down and going into liquidation because they're not cyber resilient. So just to quickly run through it, cybersecurity is basically the procedures followed and the measures taken to ensure the safety of a state or an organization, because as we say, cybersecurity is not just your business, it has national security implications, cyber warfare, cyber terrorism, and also affects the social and economic welfare of a nation and its people. And then we have cyber resilience. This is the capacity, the ability to recover once you've had a cyber attack. Um, then we go into the technologies. The technologies and the processes that we use for cybersecurity are designed to protect the organization. So cybersecurity protects. Cyber resilience technology keeps you delivering your services even after an attack. They make you resilient. So they all work together. You can't have one without the other. Cybersecurity works to reduce the risk of cyber attacks and to protect an organization from cyber theft, cyber espionage. You could have a lot of IP, intellectual property rights, which I may want to get access to as a cyber criminal. Although I should stop using myself, I am not a cyber criminal. I am a cyber security lawyer here to secure you in cyberspace. Cyber resilient, resilience works to ensure continuity, but on a wider scope. It captures cybersecurity um, 
policies that you have together, as well as your business enterprise policies. What are your business continuity plans? What are your business development plans? They need to be all incorporated into this resilience plan, especially in countries like Kenya, where we fully embrace digital transformation. And around the world, we're in what we now call the fourth industrial revolution, which is a technological revolution. Cybersecurity can work effectively without compromising the usability of other systems. I can draft a plan. I can stick it on a shelf somewhere and forget about it. It's not going to compromise my, my systems. It's there. When you ask me, do you have a plan? Oh, I'll go take it out. Blow it. Here it is. Cyber resilience is different. It now requires a mind shift in your organization and a culture shift so that you normalize and you embed everybody is aware of the cyber security, cyber resilience and cyber hygiene best practices, which is why you need to hit that golden standard of the people who the 9% of Kenyan organizations that train their staff every month. It has to become second nature, second nature to how you know you go to the bathroom, you wash your hands. I'm going to a public place these days and wear a mask. It has to be second nature. A fire alarm goes off or if I'm in traffic, I hear an ambulance, I should give it way. It has to be second nature. And the only way it can get second nature is us practicing and practicing the same way we tell our kids A, B, C, D until they get it right. Yeah, let's practice this until it's second nature to us. And finally, cybersecurity includes a business plan to resume operations in the event of a successful attack. Because every 39 seconds an attack occurs, or more than 70% of our population is online. So we're all vulnerable. Whereas cyber resilience, um, it requires you to become agile and adaptable in the face of a cyber attack and an incident. Um, you, because technology evolves rapidly. Tomorrow, um, I'll give an example. A couple of weeks ago, if I had uh, sat in front of you and told you SimSwap, chances are most of you would not even have known what SimSwap is. But suddenly it's been in the news and everybody knows yeah, if my device is slowing down or I'm told to switch it off, I better not switch it off because the cyber criminals will use that opportunity to get access to my device and drain my accounts. So we now know. So what you didn't know last week and you know now, you would now incorporate that into your cyber resilience plan. It's the one that evolves and keeps on being adapting. And that's why in, when I was talking about your cybersecurity cycle and you have to have the people who monitor your CDC, Cyber Defense Center in your organization, or if it's a single organization, you've been able to monitor yourself and see what you're doing and check your systems. Are your systems slowing down? Do you have antivirus and anti-malware protection? You have to be agile. If there is, for example, many of us get these patches we get on our computers or our phones, which says update phone, and you're like, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow, and then tomorrow never comes. The reason why these major companies are sending you what we call those patches, those updates, is because they've seen a vulnerability in their system. And when you update it, you secure yourself from that vulnerability. And that should be taken. Um, not, not every update comes from a legitimate source. So you also need to ensure it's an update coming from a legitimate source. And I think, Mudoni, in a nutshell, that kind of covers the two, the, the, the major distinction between the two. And then now cyber hygiene are these best practices that you use every day. Thank you so much, Mutheo, and I am I'm certain that that has uh, indeed been resourceful for the persons who joined us much later in the presentation. Um, we have now closed the poll, and uh, just very quickly before we move to the closing segment, uh, the first poll, which was um, about how many of our participants or their organizations have implemented any cybersecurity process, we did receive uh, five, pe five people or organizations or representatives of the organizations, if I must say, who say they do not have any cybersecurity process. And we have one who has had um, a cybersecurity process in their organization. Uh, the poll question two, which was about how many of those who answered no mm -hmm. to the first question see the need to prioritize their organization's uh, cyber resilience 
profile and ensuring that their teams are conversant with cyber hygiene practices. And we obviously have over 50% who say yes, indeed, they now see the need to answer, to, to have or to prioritize organization cyber resilience. And that I think speaks very clearly to the fact that this, this session has definitely been helpful in help in supporting MSMEs to work towards developing cybersecurity strategies or formulating practices that will lead them towards cyber resilience. I do not see any other questions on our chat box. We do not have any other questions from the floor. And I will therefore now move to the final part of our presentation or our session today uh, by handing back to Jean Njeri from Invest in Africa Kenya for the closing remarks. Over to you, Jean. Thank you very much, Mudoni for your wonderful moderation. My name is Jean Jerry, and I'm a program assistant with the SME and projects team at Invest in Africa, Kenya. And I'm delighted to move a vote of thanks today at the end of this um, insightful webinar, especially in the area of building cyber resilience. So first of all, I'd like to thank our speaker of the day, Ms. Mudeo Kizulu. Thank you so much for the insights that you've shared on cyber resilience, cyber security, and the steps that organizations can take so that they can actually move towards being more resilient in terms of the cyberspace and in terms of their virtual interactions. Uh, I will now move on to thank our moderator of the day, Ms. Mudoni Jogu. Thank you so much again for you know, um, your larger participation in, uh, in our risk resilience initiative as Invest in Africa. We have learned so much from you and we continue to just value your, your input in um, coming up with these sessions and, and assisting us in organizing each of them. And then I would also like to thank our event partners for the day, Mastercard Foundation and Strathmore Business School, with whom we have walked the journey of building MSME disaster resilience and whom, with whom we also have shared experiences just um, working towards strengthening the SME uh, sector. I would also like to, to thank the organizing team from Invest in Africa, um, our event partners once again, and everyone who has just contributed to this session most especially the participants, because you are the ones who are walking the talk of risk resilience and uh, disaster management. You are the ones who are strengthening our African economies, and you are the ones who we are, uh, the entire initiative is all about and is built upon. Uh, we, we, we thank you so much for the time that you have taken to just join us today and just sending um, your thoughts, comments, and questions uh, continually over the course of our initiative. Once again, we want to thank you all for just making the time and uh, we do look forward to more insightful sessions in the future. 